A spokesperson Pagamile Lubi and Dennis George, General Secretary of FEDUSA in our Cape Town studios. Thank you very much for joining us, Dennis Pagamile. Thank you for having us. Having Good me. evening. Thanks a lot. Now, a fair way to start would be to look at the stance of both organizations. Uh, Pagamila, I'll start with you, um, with NIMSA saying that they absolutely disagree with this 20 rand per hour slash 3,500 to 3,900 per month. Take us through that. Well, it's, it's really very simple. As NUMSA, we reject outright um, this amount of 20 rand per hour. Um, it's been dubbed a, okay, we, we've already accepted that it's not a living wage. And that is precisely the problem that we have as NUMSA, is that our members feel that 20 rand per hour, frankly, is an insult. Not only is it um, not a living wage, but it's no way for a, a country that is serious about tackling the challenges of unemployment, inequality and poverty to deal with these serious problems. Now, the primary function of the national minimum wage was that it was supposed to deal with the, the problem of equality that South Africa has. Both the World Bank and the IMF have said that in order for you to improve South Africans participating in the economy, you have to raise the level of the, of the salaries so that workers can spend money on the economy. I mean, business depends on consumers. So if you are paying people 20 rand per hour, how on earth is the economy expected to grow? Furthermore, I, I just want to add that the average worker supports at least eight dependents. Now, once again, it brings us back to this issue of 20 rand per hour and how this is really supposed to assist our workers and their families to sustain themselves. Now, Dennis, I'd like to bring you in here. Um, you've got stakeholders and government saying that, well, this is a start. We heard the deputy president saying that today. You've got NUMSA, where Pagamile says, actually, this is an insult to our workers. Where does FEDUSA stand on this and why did it sign this agreement? Yeah, look, I think a person has to look at the facts. And the facts tells us that about 6 million people are currently earning less than um, 3,500 rand per month. And some of the lowest earned people, according to Statistics South Africa, earn a salary of 1,200 rand. Now, for those people that earn that very low salary uh, currently, and uh, the, the, that the minimum wages would be really a blessing for them because that will really push up their incomes um, to a level of uh, 3,500 rand, um, or which is equivalent to 20 rand per hour. So that is something that is quite uh, critical. But, but you must also accept that we have been negotiating with government and with business and community in NETAC for a period of more than two years. And we got to a point where we couldn't move, you know, from, from labor side. We wanted to have 4,500 rand for our people. And um, the government gave a much lower amount. And that's the time when we decided to refer it to the panel of experts um, from our various universities. And they've done a thorough study. They've looked at the research that's been provided. And I must say that, you know, the, the, the recommendation from the panel and the way we're going to introduce it is really going to make a difference for those people that earn less than 3,500 rand. And we, uh, from our side, also make the point that we accept that the minimum wages is not the living wages. But I think that is a good start for us to move our people forward from here. I think something common that you've mentioned, uh, both you, Pagamila and Dennis, um, is the living wage versus the minimum wage. That's something we can't ignore. Let's look at that reality, because you did say now, I mean, you heard Dennis saying that, um, you know, the negotiations were taking place. At some point, it was 4,500 rand. But is that even enough? Is 4,500 rand enough? So let's look at NUMSA's take um, on the living wage versus the minimum wage. One of the problems we felt uh, was an issue with this process is that we felt that what should have happened is that the minimum wage should have been determined according to the sectors, um, that we should have analysed this matter based on what each sector can afford to pay, firstly. Secondly, in doing that analysis, we felt that it needed to be very, uh, it was essential that um, while you're analyzing each sector, you need to also make sure that you analyze the salaries of the most highest paid executives versus the salary of the most lowest paid worker so that you can come to a, an, uh, an informed decision of what would be a fair wage. 
Um, this is part of the problem that we have with this, uh, this minimum wage, is that we don't feel that enough consideration has been done along those lines. Secondly, on the issue uh, that Dennis George makes about how you know, essentially, this is better than nothing. I mean, I, I heard the deputy president earlier talking about how, yes, it's not a living wage, but it's a step in the right direction. And the question I really want to pose to both of them is that how long are African workers expected to suffer with the compromises that have been made since 1994? At what point do we start to actually really take seriously some of the pro promises, and not just the promises, but the reasons for the struggle before 1994, workers, many, many thousands of South Africans died fighting for the right, for a living wage, for the right to dignity. Can we really say that 20 rands per hour in, 2000, in 2017 is the best that we can do as this government? That really, as NUMSA, is not good enough. Now, Dennis, we've seen um, the number of experts that came in during this analysis, during the negotiations, um, even Pagamile now mentioning that a lot of consideration wasn't made in terms of looking at the various sectors and what they can afford. Let's look at your take in terms of this living wage. You were saying that, you know, well, 3,500 rand is a blessing, for lack of a better word, compared to the 1,200 rand that someone might be getting. Um, but looking at the difference between a living wage and a minimum wage, isn't that way far off? Yeah, look, I think a person must also look into the social wage, you know, compact, because, you know, the service that government provides uh, free health, you know, free education, housing that is being provided. I think the critical point is this, that the person must weigh up, you know, between, you know, where do you want to set the minimum wages? Uh, and then you must also have look, you know, critically in the situation of the off-balance in terms of how many jobs could be lost. And within a regime where you're sitting with a situation where you have huge amount of people that is unemployed in South Africa, you know, and, 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 and I think it is critical for all responsible leaders, you know, not to make this uh, up issues and points about apartheid wage and a colonial wage and 20 years into democracy. I think we must look at the reality. And the reality is this, and I think this is a good step for us to start off with that particular amount of 3,500 and, and an amount of 20 rand per hour for the start. And I think we are now have set up people uh, on, on a way that um, from now on, the wages would be every time reviewed. And, and also, obviously, this is not a miracle silver bullet. I think, you know, people must also focus in terms of improving our own education and look at principles of lifelong learning because there is a link between uh, education of our people and also what is the earnings that they earn. Uh, in terms of what kind of jobs they are doing. You know, we need to put them up into better learnerships and apprenticeships and all those things because we don't want our people just to swim at the surface at the minimum. We want them to move higher up in the uh, labor market so that they can earn much more better salaries for themselves. Now, we've heard from government, we heard the DP today, we've heard from all the experts, all the analysis. But the biggest voice here is the voice of the worker. What mandate did you get from your members? when well, it comes to the national minimum wage? Well, first of all, and, and this is a reality that uh, this government needs to accept, is that even though we're not part of, of NEDLAG, as NUMSA, we represent a, a trade union that carries the largest number of workers, over 330,000 to be exact. And our workers are saying, hell no to this national minimum wage. And because we are a worker-driven union, and because we care about what our workers are telling us, we are rejecting this national minimum wage. I want to also latch on to some of the things that Dennis George has spoken about. He's spoken about um, social compact and the fact that, you know, this government supplies uh, free health care and education. I'd, I'd actually like to clarify that because, first of all, um, we know that the majority of South African workers spend more than 50% of their salaries on public transportation, which is not subsidized. What does this 20 rand per hour do to, to deal with that? We also know that we have students right now who are fighting for free education, something that this government failed to provide them in spite of the promises that they made election after election. Again, what can 20 rand per hour get you? 
And let's talk about healthcare. We already know that our health system is collapsing. What happened last week, where we had a situation of 94 patients dying for nothing, literally for no reason. These people died of hunger and neglect. Why? Because our government, in implementing its neoliberalist economic policies, cut corners to cut costs, and 94 people died. So these are the consequences of these neoliberalist um, decisions. There is, you know, the way that um, uh, there is this expectation, what particularly from business. And frankly, I've been hearing it from some members of COSATU and we've been hearing it even from FEDUSA, where there's this tone almost that sure. workers just need to swallow yeah, this. You know, this is the reality so of the about? situation. Um, Please let me finish, sir. Uh, Dennis, you'll get your chance just Thank now. Thank you. Um, the point is that we've been, we've been telling workers to, to tighten their belts, but at what point does business have to, where, at when will business start to take a knock or, or for the decisions that it's been making? At, all along, it's workers who've been suffering and workers who've been under pressure. When are the workers going to get a break? I think in summary, Dennis, there we've got Pagamile, you know, looking at some of these socioeconomic issues um, that workers face. Um, and NUMS is basically saying that, you know, this minimum wage is not enough to deal with those issues. Um, what's your take on that? I know you had a lot to say um, with what Pagamile um, commented yes. on. Look, look, I mean, I think first of all, a person must speak about facts. We know for a fact that about 16 million people in our country are receiving a monthly grant from the state. And those grants go to families and poor families. Um, so I think it is totally unfair if a person just makes these things off as it is nothing. It is a real contribution that are made in terms of trying the process forward. I mean, the point is, uh, NUMSA is entitled to their opinion and whatever they think. But for us, the important thing is we've dealt with this particular matter. We've consulted with the experts. We've worked with the ILO to see that what is it that we can do practically to help our people. And we think that this particular minimum wage that we came forward with was something that is credible. It's something that has been, you know, researchers have looked at. And I think it's something that we can move our people forward. You know, Rome wasn't built in one day. And there's many people that has their own opinions and that is their right. And we still argue from our point that the minimum wages is not the living wages. I think without digressing, I want us to reel ourselves back in and to look at this national minimum wage and the realities um, that, that we face. I mean, something that you mentioned earlier on was the fact that maybe they should have looked at what each sector can afford. But let's look at the issues of, for example, you know, a lack of skills um, in terms of skills development. Something that Dennis mentioned earlier on was, you know, we should be getting um, South Africans, we should be getting them upskilled, etc. Education is something else that you both mentioned. So let's look at the realities versus what you are now saying, saying that this is not enough. But how do you determine what is enough for who? And how long is it going to take us to get there? You know, I think <clears throat> when we're discussing the national minimum wage, we also have to look at the South African economy it's in its entirety. Um, it's not enough that um, we're going to, you know, I, I, in my view, I actually suspect that this is the ruling party's way of implementing radical economic transformation. Um, we need to do much more than implementing a national minimum wage, which frankly is not a living wage that anybody can survive on. Okay, let's just start there. We, 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 we have a situation where these neoliberalist economic policies are the reasons that we find ourselves in this situation where now labor has compromised itself to the point where they've accepted a deal which is actually not good for the workers. This is the reason why COSATU is delaying and signing. It's because they know, like we know, that this is a bad deal. They know it's a bad deal, they said as much, but they're going to have to reconcile themselves with the fact that they agreed to it, in spite of the fact that they know very well that this is not good for workers. Ultimately, what needs to happen, and what NUMSA has been saying consistently, and it's part of the reason why we were expelled from COSATU to begin with, is that we can no longer support a government which pursues neoliberalist economic policies which, and their goals are to, to um, uh, uh, oppress the worker. And, and, and the, the workers' situation has not improved in South Africa. What needs to happen is that our government 
when they talk about radical economic transformation, they need to put their money where their mouth is. They need to offer students free education. They need to nationalize the mines. They need to nationalize the banks. Why can't we do what Norway has done? Nationalized oil, increased taxes, so that all that money can be used properly on social spending and true development of the people. Not this half-hearted attempt, which is what this 20 rand per hour is. And actually, I find it really interesting that everybody's latching onto 3,500 rand. When you calculate it at eight hours a day for five days a week, it actually comes to 3,200 rand. And part of the problem with them accepting a 20 rand per hour wage deal is that it gives business the freedom to, to say how many, hours, say how many hours that people can work. So it, there's no guarantee that people are going to be taking home 3,900 rand. So let's not delude the public here. This is not a good deal for workers. Dennis, I'd like you to come in there. I mean, we've looked at the realities yes. um, in terms of this, saying, you know, you even said it. You said, well, this is a start. Um, it's not a living wage, but we're headed in that direction. How long is it going to take to, to, for, for government, for all these stakeholders to get to a point where we get to a figure that is considered a living wage and that is considered fair, where you can have the likes of NUMSA coming in and saying that, well, this time around, we can sign this off, for example. Or you have, a, you have um, this, the case of Kosatu, where they also come in and say, there's no consideration here, this is definitely a living wage, and we'll sign on it. Yeah, look, let us start and look at what is the context. I've explained to you in the beginning, when we look at the numbers that Statistics South Africa put forward, and they showed us that the salaries for the people right at the bottom that earn less than 2,500, there's about 4 million of those people. And it's very critical for us to look at the facts. And if a person moves those people's salary up to 3,500 rand or 20 rand per hour, you know, that is really a step and it makes a difference for that particular people. I think the issue is this, um, the point that our colleague have also mentioned, in our bargaining councils, we have the situation where you look at what is the wages that has been set there, but that is not the minimum wages because those people are not affected by the minimum wages. The people that are affected really by the minimum wages is people that falls outside of the bargaining councils. And it's also the people, like for instance, your agricultural workers that has been negatively affected. I mean, I've looked at now, the lowest paid workers in South Africa currently is people that are working in hairdressing salons. And, 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 and therefore you can see for yourself, you know, when you look at the facts and you look at what is the recommendations of the experts, then we are rather going to bet our, 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 ourself on, 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 on a study that was done and based on empirical evidence. Um, but we are not going to get ourselves, you know, involved where we say, look, I'm not satisfied and that the facts for us is, the facts speak for itself. We need to now look at drafting the legislation we need to focus on closing the loopholes so that people don't reduce the hours for workers and that we make sure that we, that we introduce this thing so that there's proper enforcement for the particular minimum wage for South Africa. And like all other countries, Germany, England, all of them have introduced a, a minimum wages. And we've seen uh, on, on, on the empirical evidence, we're going to make sure that we're going to uh, help our people to get out of poverty, but we also on the other side believe this is only one instrument. There's many other instruments that can be used to empower people. As I've said earlier to you, we need to put our people on learnerships, we need to put our people on apprenticeships, and we don't want our people just to swim at the bottom of the lake. We really want them to move up in the labor market. There are one or two more things that I'd like us to look at before we wrap up. Um, but before we do that, Pagamila, I want to look at what NUMSA is going to do next. So we're here now where you say we definitely um, reject this 20 rand per hour agreement. We're not going to sign on it. What's next? Well, for us, the answer is clear. Our members have directed us since Congress in December the, uh, last year that if this minimum wage is implemented as is, that not only should we reject it, but we should fight with all our might to prevent its implementation. And that is precisely what we intend to do. So um, we will spend um, the time this year up at, um, 
really just mass mobilizing our people. We will be out on the streets, we will be picketing, and if necessary, we will embark on mass shutdowns. And whilst we are doing that, we are also going to be fighting this issue in court. And we'll go all the way to the Constitutional Court if need be, in order for us to ensure that the rights of workers have been protected. Now, just finally, for both of you, and you can start, Dennis, if, if you'd like, um, tomorrow is the State of the Nation address. From Fedusa, what would you like to hear uh, President Jacob Zuma prioritizing in his uh, address tomorrow? Yeah, look, I think what we have already said is that we set ourselves a target of getting our economy to grow at least at about 5.4% per annum. And currently our economy is growing less than 1%. And what is critical for us to have the economy to, to grow at a much higher rate, we want to see that the growth is inclusive. And we also want to see that we want to bring more of our people from the emerging uh, um, uh, entrepreneurs to come into the economy so that they can participate, so that we can have more people being represented in the economy. And then I think we want to see that government improve uh, on service delivery to our people. I think we can really make a big difference in education. I think we can make a big difference in health. And then also when it comes to the deliver of housing for our people, I think that's areas that, that we can make a huge difference in the lives of our people. And for you, Pagamile, as NUMSA, I know you will not be attending the State of the Nation address, but in terms of what will be, um, you know, in the content of that address, what would you like to see the president focusing on in this address? Well, um, you know, as NUMSA, we don't really have any expectations from this government to do any, you know, last week, they, or two weeks ago at the ANC Lohotla, they spoke at length about how um, the plan now is to implement radical um, economic transformation. Can I just come in there? And I see, I mean, I see your reaction when you say radical economic transformation. And that's, uh, that's something that the, the ANC has been, and, and government in general, has been speaking about a lot um, mm -hmm. leading up to the State of the Nation address. Um, and you've got opposition parties saying that, well, this has been our stance. Now, you know, you're latching onto it ahead of the State of the Nation address. Why haven't you been focusing on it all along? So what's your take on that? Do you think it's just a statement um, that lacks, you know, any content? And it's just the thing of saying that we need to do something in order to give people hope again, in order to make people believe in us again. Well, that's precisely what it is. I mean, the ANC has been doing a lot of that, particularly for the last 22 years. They're very good with the revolutionary uh, slogans. But when you actually look at what, what they're actually doing, the two don't match up. And that's precisely why NUMSA made the, the decision in 2013 to, to, to reject uh, and to stop supporting the, uh, President Jacob Zuma and the ANC. Um, for us, really, what radical transformation means, it means going back to the Freedom Charter. I mean, we, the reason that our people fought and died for the struggle was because of the aspirations that they laid out in the Freedom Charter. Our people had a vision for what South Africa should look like, a, a country of, uh, of equality. And the only way that that, that, that that can be achieved is through nationalization of the mines, um, through nationalization of the banks, free quality tertiary education. Those are some of the things we'd like to hear, but we know we're not going to hear tomorrow. So um, as far as what we expect from the, the State of the Nation address, we certainly don't expect any uh, uh, radical economic policies to be discussed or to be um, uh, uh, revealed tomorrow. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Dennis, thank you very much for joining us from our Cape Town studios and you, Pagamila, you've been really great. Some opposing views there, but it's been a very interesting discussion and we wait to see what comes out of this national minimum wage, but also the State of the Nation address, which takes place tomorrow. That was NUMSA spokesperson Pagamile Lubi and Dennis George. He's the General Secretary of FEDUSA. We'll have more news for you after the break.